We're joined here by our good friend. I see, Ben, I say that, and it's the first time that we've had you on AYS. First off, thank you uh, for joining us. But Ben McKee, who covers the Vols for 247 Sports and at GoVols247 on Twitter, you can follow him. Ben, I got to ask you before we talk about this LSU and Tennessee series, though, man. You're a Yankees fan. That's what I love to hear, baby. Here come the Yankees, baby. I love it. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> I, I'm I'm doing great. Opening day tomorrow, uh, 105 p.m. Eastern. That's just, right. Uh, just, just thankful that we don't have to watch Aaron Judge come back in the Yankee Stadium as a, a San Francisco Giant. So uh, I, I'm blessed. And, and then on top of opening day, I, I think it's very fitting that on opening day we get number one LSU versus number 10 Tennessee. So uh, I, I'm jacked up. It's going to be a fun weekend of baseball. I went to the doctor, Ben, a while back. Darren, it was around MLB free agency, and I was having heart palpitations. So I asked my doctor, he says, has anything changed? I said, yeah, Aaron Judge might be going to San Diego. He goes, oh, I have your diagnosis. It's called a broken heart. So, yes, I am with you. I am glad uh, that the that the judge uh, is back in the pinstripe. So let's talk about this. So I don't want to – I know that our listeners, I'm already getting the text. I can see them now. Blake, stop talking about the Yankees. Let's talk some LSU and Tennessee. Ben, there's a misconception, I think, a little bit when it comes to Tennessee. And and some things, like, look, they're still at 20 wins. They're a top 10 team. They're still a really good team. Doe Lander is a guy that, you know, a lot of people, oh, well, he's 4-2. and two. He's having a down year. I get that. But, man, Doe Lander is still really good. With that, he's sitting around a 4 ERA. He's 4-2 he's and two on the season. I still think he's done really good. But what has he not done this year so compared to last, like what's happened so far to him this year where teams have been able to hit on him a little bit? Yeah, and, and I like what you said. He, he's been good. He just hasn't been great yet. He, right. It just hasn't clicked for him. He, he hasn't been the Chase Dolander that we saw last season or the, the Chase Dolander that was talked about all offseason long. And uh, his, his stuff is, is still there for the most part. But obviously, if, if you're not living up to your potential, your, your stuff isn't all the way there. Right, uh, but my my point in saying that is, I, I think that he's still trying to adjust mentally. Uh, th this is a guy that started his career at Georgia Southern, uh, a under recruited type of guy. Al although his stuff probably he, he should not have started at Georgia Southern, um, but still started at Georgia Southern. Uh, he he wasn't a, a, a Blake Burke coming out of high school in terms of recruiting profile. Or even his fellow Chase on the staff, Chase Burns, uh, guys that Tennessee kind of had to sweat out the MLB draft with. Uh, but Dolander transfers to Tennessee, uh, is SEC Pitcher of the Year kind of right out of the gates. And I, I kind of like a, a rush to, to, to fame relatively in a short period of time. And not to, to say that it's completely getting to his head, but just trying to adjust to, to being at the top of the scouting report and everybody knowing who he is. Uh, knowing what he's what he's pitching for, uh, what's on the line every time he toes the the rubber every single Friday night. I think just adjusting to to being that dude because looking at last year's Tennessee team, you had Drew Gilbert and and Jordan Beck and Evan Russell and so many guys who people were aware of, and, and not that not that Dolander has the personality to to hide behind those guys, but he was kind of behind those guys by default because he was the new guy. And then now this offseason, he's the face of the program in, in a sense in, in terms of potential and talent and prospects. So I think a little bit of adjusting to that. And and look, Tennessee's going to have Paul Skeens circled and, and excited to face uh, tomorrow night. Blake Burke's going to want to prove a point, and, and so will everybody else in Tennessee's lineup. That's the same with Chase Dolander. All, all of these college players know exactly who Chase Dolander is his draft status, and, and they want to show out against them. So I, I think it's more so just the, a mentality change, uh, nothing too extreme one way or the other, but just trying to adjust to, to this new life uh, of being this top prospect. And, uh, you know, last Friday they, they had a miscommunication with the catcher. Uh, the, the catcher thought that they were going off a wristband and or thought they were going off the pitch comm. Uh, system and, and Dolander wasn't going off the pitch comm system. So just little things like that have gotten in the way this season. And uh, I, I still think it's just a matter of time before it, it clicks for him. It's just kind of adjusting to this new lifestyle as a baseball player, so to speak. Do you think that Vitello had to reset some of these guys a little bit? Because I, 
Ben, I don't even know how to ask this question because I, I keep hearing people around college baseball saying, oh, Tennessee, they're, they're a little down this year. And I'm thinking, guys, we're 25, 26, 27 games, some into this schedule, and they got 20 wins. I, I mean, it, it's kind of so crazy to me. But let me ask you this. If there is one weakness necessarily that Tennessee has had in some of these struggles, what is it? Is it a personnel thing? Is it just maybe they've hit a little bit of luck? Or, as the old saying goes, is it just been baseball? Yeah, I, I think it's just a, it's a new group of guys. I, I think that's been the, the biggest thing. And uh, because Tony Vitello has established this brand name of Tennessee baseball and everybody saw what they did the last two years – I think they they have just sort of expected to to repeat what happened the last two years with going to Omaha two years ago. And then last year, I know Ole Miss won the national championship and and Tennessee came up short. I get all that, but you can't convince me that Tennessee was not the best team in all of college baseball. Oh, I don't disagree with you there. I don't disagree at all. They had one bad Sunday uh, against Notre Dame, and – it, it was a game that kind of came down to the wire, sixth, seventh inning, whatever it was. And, and Notre Dame was able to touch up Tennessee for a home run, two home runs, and, and get out of there with a series win. So Tennessee was the best team in college baseball last year, and they returned quite a bit off of that team, uh, mainly off the, the pitching staff, Dolander, Chase Burns, Drew Beam, uh, some bullpen arms as as well. Uh, Blake Burke and Christian Moore, Jared Dickey, they, they weren't necessarily the Jordan Becks and Drew Gilberts. Last year in the lineup, they weren't the main catalysts, but they they played a role and, and made some really big time plays, both uh, in the box and, and in the field throughout the season, to where you could see the potential for those guys down the road and, and get excited about them. So I think because of of the pitching, the starting rotation coming back, and because the Blake Burks in the lineup coming back, people just assumed that Tennessee would pick up where it left off, and and like you said. Tennessee is still a good baseball team. It's just in the early phases of re-imaging itself, and mainly with the lineup. There's not a single returning starter in the lineup. There's still a lot of talent, but Blake Burke, Christian Moore, Jared Dickey, even those guys didn't start for Tennessee last year. Dickey did at times with battled injuries, uh, and Burke and Moore made some some spot starts, but they were behind Jarrell Ortega and Luke Lipsius and, and several others. So, there's been a, an adjustment period, uh, a grace period, and, and they're still going through that. Are they the number two team in the country, like all the preseason polls voted them behind LSU? No. Uh, do they have the potential to get there? Yes. We'll see if they reach that potential because there's still a ton of talent on this roster. It's just a lot of new faces outside of the starting rotation in new positions and, and new roles, and, and they're still trying to adjust. So that that's why there's been a little disconnect, I think, uh, thinking that Tennessee is is down because, hey, they were ranked preseason number two, and they haven't looked like the number two team in the country, especially when you have Florida in your own division being as oh. impressive as anybody, South Carolina, so many good teams in the SEC. Tennessee hasn't necessarily passed the eye test, in my opinion, to, to being that top five baseball team yet because there is so much newness. And Tony Vitello has been saying that since the preseason. He, he's flat out said since – December, January, that everybody's overhyping them. And this is a completely different baseball team and a new group of guys who are going to have to earn what they get because Drew Gilbert and Jordan Beck, those guys are kind of what built this new age Tennessee legacy. And these guys have, haven't done anything yet outside of those starting pitchers. What have you seen from LSU that you like? Oh, oh and, uh, and, 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 sorry to really interrupt you. And is, is there any weaknesses that you've seen in them too? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, let me just say this. You get a good lefty in there against them, they could struggle. But that that's, you know, that's on me. But what have you seen from LSU that you like? Yeah, and, and speaking to the lefty thing from Tennessee's perspective, uh, all of Tennessee's starters are righties. So I guess that would play into to LSU's favor. And They're hitting 400, and, Ben. They're hitting 400. <laughs> well, that that's – that. yeah, I – I, oh, I, I, I have to do with the mustache that curls. What's his name? Yeah, Kirby Cannell. He he's their only lefty uh, at, at the moment, and he's more of a, a lefty specialist. Uh, and he he's he's a fifth year senior, if I'm not mistaken. I believe he's taking advantage of the COVID year this right. year, and, and he's gotten a ton of big outs for Tennessee in the past. But obviously, this LSU lineup is is, is it, its own beast, uh, and 
Tennessee has a young lefty that's not pitching right now because he's been dealing with some arm soreness that he, he's going to be a big time prospect has been a big time prospect that Tennessee stole from South Carolina uh, and, and is really going to be really, really good, but he's not pitching at the moment. So the, Tennessee lacks lefties. I don't know if that's a good thing or, or bad thing for Tennessee. This I don't weekend, know if you but... just say, saw me make the, the cross signal. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, 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 there, yeah. There's re- a lot of reasons uh, for LSU to be very confident. Uh, they, they are the best team in the SEC right now, in my opinion, and, and the best team in the country for sure. I don't know if Florida and LSU play uh, during the regular no, season. Yeah, they don't. They don't play this year for the first time. I think like five years, which is wild. And that's unfortunate because Florida's right. Florida's been. I expected this from LSU, so I'm not like super surprised by what they're doing. And I thought Florida would be good, but I didn't think they'd be this impressive with what their rotation is doing and, and what their lineup is doing from top to bottom. So I, I kind of think Florida and LSU are the two best teams in the SEC right now, and that would be a, a fun series. So I hate that we're not getting that one during the regular season, but who knows? Maybe we'll get it in the postseason. But the, what's not to like about LSU? Uh, their, their starting rotation is rock solid. Their, their lineup is just a beast, as I said a moment ago. I, I guess if you want to split hairs, and, and you would know the LSU bullpen situation better than me, but – uh, just on paper, maybe unproven depth. You're not wrong there. there. You're not wrong. Maybe, maybe. That's the only thing I see, though. And, and I, I, I saw statistically speaking, they don't steal a lot of bases. But you don't have to steal a lot of bases when when you hit the way that LSU does. So <laughs> uh, right. we'll, we'll see how the pitching depth from top to bottom. The top is really, really, really good. But that pitching depth that you need to go win a championship, especially in the bullpen, we'll, we'll see over the course of the season whether that's a – a weakness or not, but I, that that's, again, that's splitting hairs. No, no LSU fans. Please don't come tweet me. No, I don't think that you're wrong though. And I don't think that any LSU fan with a brain can tell you that you're wrong. Um, I think that that's spot on. I, I do agree with you. I want to see Paul Skeens versus Jack Caglione, right? Like I, I want to see Paul Skeens at one Oh two. I mean, Ben, he's hitting one Oh two. I, I mean, like consistently. And so for even from a look, People that don't realize Louisiana, they will put baseball ahead of basketball. I don't think most people get that, right? And so when you talk about that and you got a dude that's dominating like Skeens, they might put a statue of the dude out here, okay? And we're not even through the season. I I do think that we're missing that. You know what's interesting, though? We do have a really good matchup with a lefty and Paul Skeens is coming up tomorrow. That's Blake Burke. You know what's interesting as much as I've watched Blake Burke hit, and I think he's got one of the pure swings that I've seen in a long time from an SEC perspective, he's got 10 home runs but 28 RBIs, which wanted me to ask you the question, how was he like legitimately generating that much power, but the RBIs are not the equivalent of what a dude this far in the season with 10 home runs? Is it, What am I missing there? Am I, am I missing something? Why is the high home run so high and the RBIs not so much? Well, because uh, not to to just sound super simplistic, but the guys in front of them have have not been getting on on a, a consistent basis, and that kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Not not a single starter returns in in the lineup outside of Jared Dickey, who made I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I want to say like fifteen or so starts last year before he got hurt, and, and then wasn't really able to come back one hundred percent, and and was more of a pinch hitter uh, as the season dwindled down last year. Um, the, the, the lineup has been somewhat of a revolving door as Tony Vitello tries to piece things together. And, uh, there's a ton of talent there in the outfield and in the infield at, at catcher. But again, a lot of new guys and, and younger guys stepping into new roles. So trying to, to fill those pieces and, and, and see where each guy fits best. And they're starting to, to come in to a lineup, I, I think. Uh, but you also had the situation with Maui Ahuna, the the transfer shortstop, who right. I'm, I'm sure LSU fans, all the college baseball fans, are, are well aware of, of you that stole situation. It. Y'all stole him. Thanks. <laughs> that that's okay. I'm I'm sure Tony Vitello would like to say that uh, LSU stole Tommy Tanks and, and Paul Skeens. <laughs> so uh, they they it, it's funny LSU, right. Arkansas, Tennessee. It's always the, the same teams re- recruiting the same guys, and and no Tennessee doubt. was able to, to to get that one for sure. But he did miss the first five, seven games of the season, and, and he's been the leadoff hitter, so he wasn't there at the start of the year. Uh, Christian Moore has been really, really good in the two-hole, really, really good. 
uh, Tennessee second baseman. I, I think he's had an underrated and one of the more underrated players in the SEC. Not enough people talk about him. Uh, he was another guy that Tennessee was – glad that they survived the MLB draft with a couple of years ago. He's he's from New York, from the Bronx. Uh, and as, a, as a matter of fact, or it might be Brooklyn. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but a New York kid uh, who, who made it down here. And he's uber talented, uber talented, and, and does a good job at drawing walks. I want to say he has 24 so far in the season. He but, does have uh, 24. That's how you know a man knows his stuff, because I got it right <laughs> here. It is 24. Yeah, it, it's, it's just been a kind of a revolving door as – Tony Vitello tries to piece together the the lineup that he feels is is best. Still trying to learn this team. It, it's still early in SEC play, and we still have two months to go before the NCAA tournament, SEC tournament. So, uh, whatever lineup trots out there this weekend for Tennessee will probably still look different than the one we see in Hoover in a couple of months. But but that's been the main thing. Uh, Blake's been awesome this year, and and I like what you said about his swing. I mean, it. I this isn't like me being crazy. It, it looks Ken Griffey Jr. s. Just how I agree with that. Then. And the backswing, it, it's it's nice, and, and he has just unreal exit velocity. Uh, and, and he has been – he was in a little bit of a slump in, until the A&M series. Uh, was like 0 for 14, 1 for 15 entering the A&M weekend. So that that had a, a little bit to do with it as well. But he, he's had a tremendous year, and if Tennessee's going to have success this weekend, they're, they're going to need him to barrel up some baseballs. Ben, do you feel the – or does Tennessee and the fans or do you feel the pent-up frustration that LSU has towards Tennessee because of how the last two years went? You know, Paul Manier, look, a lot of people wanted Paul to leave, but Paul's still Paul, right? And that was the last series that he coached in that Super Regional versus Tennessee and then last year. Do you feel like – because let me just tell you something. So the, the chat knows this. I mean, every day I'm at LSU, okay? And so – Passing by today, they're already tailgating, which doesn't happen in a lot of places. It's because they're pissed. Do you feel that, though? Do you feel the energy of this series? Because, man, I, I will tell you, I have not seen this in a long, long time on a Wednesday that people are already getting ready to tailgate. Yeah, I, I definitely feel the energy. Maybe, maybe not the exact energy that you all are feeling uh, because I don't, I don't know if you noticed, but College baseball doesn't like Tennessee. Uh, the, the college, <laughs> the, the college baseball world does does not like. No, Tony I Vitello. did not know that. <laughs> yeah, they, and, and look, the ten, they they do get a a worse rap than they deserve. Uh, I they they've had their moments. Look, Tony bumping the the umpire in the chest last year, uh, the the middle finger to the Georgia Tech outfielder is, as. Uh, Jordan Beck is is rounding first base in the regional, and and Drew Gilbert had his had his hot head moments. I get it, I really do, but I don't think I don't think it's as much as maybe people want to make it out to be. Uh, and that that is an edge that Tony Vitello likes to play with, and it 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 has come back to haunt them at, at times. Uh, it, it's why they've been able to elevate the program the way that they have. But it's also cost them at times, like that Notre Dame series when Drew Gilbert gets ejected and then Frank Anderson, the pitching coach, gets ejected. And then you're playing that game three with your season on the line without a pitching coach. Uh, and you had to play one of those games without Drew Gilbert, the heart and soul of your team. And and Drew Gilbert, the, the Tennessee baseball program will tell you is the sweetheart of, of sweethearts, as, as silly as that sounds, like as nice of a dude as, as you're going to meet. It's just – and Tony is, is really a, a great dude as well. It's just – when when they get in between the white lines, it's just something clicks and goes off and it's it switches and, and they're a, a different person. So I, I will stick up for them a little bit. I'm, I'm sure there are some out there rolling their eyes. But they're, they're good people. They, they just get a little too emotional playing the game of baseball at times. So because of those actions, what I'm getting to is that obviously the world of college baseball does not like them. And I know LSU fans definitely remember uh, Trey Morgan and – uh, Dylan Cruz and, and the rest of that freshman class coming up here a couple of years ago and, and Tennessee sticking it to them pretty good and Tennessee letting them know about it. And, and then last year at the SEC tournament in Hoover. So I, I certainly understand your frustration and the fans' frustration with Tennessee. But you got to remember, next week Florida comes to town, to Knoxville, and Tennessee and Florida cannot stand one another. The next week Tennessee goes to Arkansas and uh, Dave Van Horn and, and Tony Vitello aren't necessarily on the same page uh, at the moment. You'll have to go back and look on YouTube. Yeah, they got uh, into it pretty heavy. Yeah, yes, they, they did, and, and that was no coincidence. And uh, Arkansas fans, LSU fans may be pissed at Tennessee and, and not like Tennessee. 
it's not to the level of Arkansas fans. I, I can assure you that mm-hmm. because Tony used to coach there. And, and then the week after that, Vanderbilt comes to town. And Vanderbilt is by far Tennessee's biggest baseball rival. So, and, and then South Carolina at, at the end of the season, it, it in true Tony Vitello fashion, it's a, it's a different storyline drama wise each and every single week. So I, I am very excited about the series. I feel the energy, but probably not from the standpoint of LSU fans because I'm used to this conversation surrounding Tennessee each and every week. Makes sense. Two more if you have time, and uh, and I'll get you out of here. It's interesting because you brought up that last point, and I wasn't going to ask you this, but I kind of have to now. Like, LSU goes to South Carolina next week, and South Carolina has Mississippi State this upcoming week. They might be not – Ben, they might – South Carolina might be 9-0 in the conference this time next week. That is insane when you think about it. Kentucky – is rolling Missouri and not taking a shot at Tennessee. I really, I'm really not. But the, the sweep, and then they uh, look. They got swept by South Carolina. But if you watch any of those games, both of them came down to extras or the ninth inning that South Carolina had to take to win both of them. Do you think that of all sports, all sports, that SEC baseball is the deepest without question? Because I try to, t- I. I yell at everybody about this, and everybody tells me I'm wrong. I know that I'm not. What do you think? Oh, you, you're one thousand percent correct. You, I know. It, it's <laughs> it's not even a com- it's it's not even a conversation. And and I, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but like if if you don't understand that, then you just don't pay attention to SEC baseball, and that's fine. No, no. Everybody has their, their their sports that you like, and SEC football is awesome. Obviously, that that's the breadwinner in in the South, right? But uh, and SEC basketball has become a beast as well. I mean, just look look at all the coaches from top to bottom in, in the league right now. I mean, a, a guy like Chris Beard going to Ole Miss, and I realize that he has had his issues this calendar year. But right. still, Chris Beard at Ole Miss from a basketball standpoint is is pretty mind-blowing, especially when you consider all the coaches that, that are in the league already. But SEC baseball, it, it's just – it's different. It, it literally – means more i i think honestly the the sport that would have the the biggest argument with it would be softball because softball's the the same way and and oklahoma's got, coming in in the conference too yeah and then i know you're speaking to softball about that but texas with with baseball and right men's basketball and and football with both of those brands it, it's just different in the sec uh, that's just that's just a fact that I, no matter which way you you slice it so yeah it, it's a beast uh, right now, there's only one bad team in the SEC, in my opinion, and, and that is Mississippi State. Uh, maybe Alabama. I, I thought they were a little mm. fraudulent because they, they played a, a very soft non-conference schedule and their record looked pretty because of it, like it does every year, and then they finally get in the conference play and can't beat No, anybody. Alabama scheduling soft people to look good? <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I know. I'll let you handle, handle that <laughs> one. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so the SEC baseball is a beast. It's an absolute beast. SEC softball is, and, and you mentioned kind of baseball being more popular than basketball at LSU earlier. And I, I think it's a, a a natural thing because people in the South typically prefer baseball to basketball. So I, I think that's why it's latched on so much and and so hard. But yeah, SEC baseball is a beast, and Missouri's really really good. Tennessee that that was an embarrassing series for other reasons because they they didn't really respond to adversity and and kind of the effort wasn't what it needed to be, but Missouri's a, a real deal, good baseball team. And and I think it's going to be very similar to kind of how Ole Miss made its run last year to where Ole Miss didn't look good during the regular season. But then because the SEC really beats up on one another, all these teams get into the NCAA tournament and they beat up on everybody else. I don't think that that's a coincidence. Ben, without question, you're spot on. Before I get to this last question, Ole Miss is the best 0-6 conference team that I've ever seen. in the Dude, they absolutely mash, okay? Like, they I, I, they got up against Florida, right? They went up against Vandy. Just two teams right now that are better than them. If they still hit them at a high level. They're still really good. All right, last one. I can't let you leave here without a football question. Joe Milton. Is he going to be the dude? I think so. I, I think so. Uh, he, he has a lot to prove, uh, but I, I am buying Joe Milton stock uh, cautiously, though, if you couldn't tell from, from my pauses and, and, yeah. and hesitation. 
He look. Oh, he has all. That good. Oh, I'm sorry, but Nico looks that good so far. Is that is that your hesitation? No, it's it's more of a Joe Milton hesitation, okay. just because it, it's a small Joe Milton sample size, right? Uh, kind of the the revamped Joe Milton that we saw to end the season. It, it, it's it's a small sample size. Uh, I, I do think Joe improved greatly from year one of Heupel to year two. You could see that in the cupcake games earlier in the year when Hendon Hooker was getting all the shine because year one he was throwing overthrowing everybody. I mean, the right. passes weren't even close. Wasn't showing much touch on the on the football. Uh, wasn't showing a, a ton of awareness in the pocket. But even in those early September and October games when Tennessee was playing the cupcake games, I mean, you, you could see it in in you know garbage time. I know it was against cupcake teams, but touch carries and, and pocket awareness carries uh, against Alabama, LSU, or Tennessee Martin. Right? You either have it or you don't. And uh, I kind of do think that that's something that you either have it or you don't, but he did show improvements in that area. And it's going to be real important for him to continue to improve in that area. There, there's not a, a quarterback in the country that's more physically gifted than Joe Milton. If he comes in and balls out this year, he will be a top five pick. No doubt about it. Maybe the number one overall pick. Uh, very Jamarcus Russell ish, in my opinion, in, in oh, terms of physical stature. <laughs> Uh, arm strength, I I know I'm I'm sure it doesn't, but uh, he he has a ton of potential and, and he has taken huge steps forward both as a leader, which is obviously very important as a quarterback and, and as a passer and just simply as a football player. And, and Josh Heupel and Tennessee's new offensive coordinator Joey Halsley have a lot to to do with that. So I, I'm banking on the system and Heupel and Halsley and also just seeing the improvements that he made from. Uh, year one to year two, his his first off season under these coaches. Now a, a second off season under the same coaches. It's his job. I I, I think he will have a, a big season, but I, I I think it's only fair to be hesitant with, with saying that and, and walk into those expectations cautiously, just because you are working with a small sample size. That pass he threw the squirrel against Clemson in the end zone. That. It easily shows you that he's worked, that he's progressed a lot. I am interested to see what he looks like full time. That is Joe Milton. All right, Ben McKee, you can follow him. Um, why don't I let you do it? Because you know about more about your Twitter than I do. But from Balls Two Four Seven, Ben, thank you so much. But plug where everybody can follow you and everything that you guys are doing. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Happy to join anytime at Ben McKee Fourteen on Twitter and. Uh, we'll, we'll have the, the coverage from the Tennessee side of things at Go Vols 247 all weekend long if, if you want to check out the Tennessee perspective. I, I'm, <laughs> Tony Vitello is always good for a quote, always good for a quote, as I'm sure the people know. So if you if you want to get the good Tony Vitello quotes, we'll, we'll have them over at Go Vols 247. We are uh, – sources have told me that uh, we're going to send two Ed Orgeron sized blondes at Tony Vitello when he makes landfall in Baton Rouge so we can distract him. That's what I heard. So well, you, just just remember that Tennessee fans are not too fond of uh, Ed Orgeron, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they love Tony Vitello. Tennessee fans love Tony Vitello. So I can tell LSU fans can can pull what they want to pull, but I, I'm sure Tennessee fans are, are more than willing to to punch right <laughs> back and and try to punch even harder. Awesome, Ben, you're a great man. We'll have to bring you on again soon. Thank.